Howdy everybody, Steve here, KM9G. It is another day at the workbench. And today, eh. The camera bounces when I touch the workbench. Gonna have to worry about that. Today, I have a treat for us. We're going to install the KSB2, which is the Elecraft K2 SSB module that turns a very large CW radio into a very large all-mode radio. And I needed to get some parts. I got this off of eBay. It came with just the board and a screw. And I need a standoff and some other stuff. So I had to order some standoffs and we made it happen. Let's get over to the bench. Well, I'm already here. Come over and join me at the bench and we'll get this thing all put together and test out its sea legs, see how well it works. Danger glasses on. Perfect. So this is the thing that we are looking at. This is KSB2 and it is revision 104. I'm, I'm pointing at this. This is the label that's on the PIC chip, which is the programmable device that runs all the things on here. And we've got a, what looks like a crystal filter to me because there's a whole bunch of them lined up there and they are almost all the same value. And we have a couple of toroids. We have an adjustment trimmer there. And what else? Anything Anything else worth noting? Guess not. I did not build this. I was actually looking for a kit, but with the way Elecraft stuff is slightly unobtainium, um, I had to buy one that was already built. And it was either buy one that's already built and take a chance. We can fix it. We have the technology. Uh, or get a kit and build it and hope that it works and hope we did a good job. I don't know. On the back, it says SSB Rev D 1999 Elecraft. And there are some pin headers and so forth. So let's get the radio. This is a beauty. I love the way this thing looks. It's just got a fantastic design language about it. It just looks interesting. This is the Elecraft K2 transceiver, and it has a built in amplifier, which explains this big heatsink and the fact that it's got a couple of antenna ports on the back of it. But that is that. Now we need to get inside and work some magic. So let's do that also. I'm gonna take the side plates off. And on each side plate, there are four Phillips head screws. And then this one screw at the top here is a flathead screw for reasons, reasons that escape my ability to comprehend, but we're going in anyway. So there is side plate one off. Side plate two off. Okay, and I should not have to remove the amplifier itself. I'm just sitting it over to the side over here. There's enough slack in the cables to make everything work just fine. And then we need to get into this area here. And let me see, this here is about where it goes. But one of the things that are missing is a standoff here to give it some height, some pin headers here, some pin headers here, and some pin headers here. So we have to get into the bottom. And I'm thinking it might just be easier. Remind me that the coax piece goes in the back, the power piece goes in the middle, the ribbon cable goes onto the back of the display board, and the speaker wire goes into P5 labeled speaker. And that gets the amplifier out of the way. So now we don't have to worry about the amplifier. The pin headers need to go in through the bottom. So what do we have to do next? I'm gonna try and remove just this front section here because that should be all we need to remove. And I see a bunch of screws missing from this kit. So we'll have to get some extra screws and finish this out. Do I need to remove those two screws? Looks like it. So there is one row of pin headers, two and three. And in my collection of pin headers, I might actually have a couple that work that are already cut to the right size. I don't know. So pin headers usually come in a bar format like this, and then you just kind of chew away with your cutters to get to be the right size. But before I chew away anything, I'm going to make sure that they actually do the thing. Yeah, that's a nice positive connection. I like that. That feels good. It's important. It's important how pin headers feel, right? Yeah. 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 I know they don't go in here. I'm just checking fit and alignment and so forth. But what I am gonna do 
that I'm going to put them on to these boards here, and I'll show you why in a second when we flip it over. So we're going to trim a three and a four to give us two sets of three. There we go. Okay, so when I cut this one here, I glazed the grazed the edge of the one pin, so I don't like that. I'm going to start over with another one. Okay, so now we have pin headers installed, and then the board should just fit in there nicely. Let's get the other pin headers cleaned up and out of the way. Okay, besides the ones that shot across the room, we only dropped one the whole time. So there's a couple of reasons why I just put the pin headers in place on here. One is that puts them into perfect alignment when I go to put it into the board. And the other one is I need to figure out how to stack up the standoffs to give it the right amount of standoffishness. So let's take a look. At that. I needed to go out to Amazon and get a pack of standoffs because I wasn't 100% sure what height would be needed. So I have standoffs, I have nuts and bolts, and I have screws so we can get this job done. So that size is not right. Next size bigger. Next size bigger actually looks pretty good. And the odd part is that this standoff kit did not come with any lock washers. So I had to go and get a set of lock washers too. And of course, you can't buy just one lock washer. And it was like 10 bucks to get the, the little bag of the right size, or it was 10 bucks to get 800 of all kinds of sizes. So we have all kinds of sizes. By the end of my ham radio career, my family will be able to open up a hardware store in my, in my name. Put the standoff into place, lock washer and nut on the bottom. Okay, that is installed. I didn't really want to turn it on this side because of that toroid that's there. I didn't want to cause any harm. My Hippocratic Oath came into play. All right, screw and lock washer to screw down the standoff and that will hold the whole works in place. So all three sets of pin headers and the, K2, the KSB2 board Will all be held in place by the standoff so now i can get to soldering i think the grounds on some of those crystals is in the way holding the board up on that side yes it is let's pull this out and let's fix those grounds these two crystals right here have grounds attached to them and the grounds are attached on the top and kind of interfere with the side of this so what i'm going to do is i'm going to move them down and attach them to the side it feels like it's just a clipped off lead leg. And now they're screwed onto the, they're glued onto the sides of the crystals instead of onto the top of the crystals. And we'll try our fit one more time. There we go. That's a lot better. It seems like it's all the way down now. Might need just a little bit more height adjustment. Let's try adding a lock washer. The kit comes with the right lock washers and things that are needed, but I didn't get this as a kit. And in the kit, the method is also to add lock washers. So now we have two lock washers on there. Oh, no, I think I need a lock washer between the standoff yeah, that's what I need. That's going to be fun. So what we'll do is we'll put a lock washer under the standoff. Do I have one that's just a hair bigger? Nope, the next size up is much too big. I 
And now the standoff is just a tad taller. Oh, that's so much better. Okay, that works. I will take it. Okay, I don't know how well that's going to look on camera, but you can see that these boards are now in parallel instead of one straight and one crooked. And it's also laying much flatter to the way it looks. I am happy with that. All right, let's check our pins on the bottom side. Those pins all look good. So what I'm going to do with the pins is I'm going to tack one pin down with solder on each of the three sets of headers and then I'm going to verify that they look good and if they do I will solder the rest of them home and if they don't I'll be able to reheat that one pin's worth of solder and solve the problem. But because of the way we have it in there it's all going to be fine. That also frees up one hand so that you can work with the board. Okay, that looks good. All right it's business time. It's business time baby. Looks pretty good. I like it. Okay, in the manual it says if your serial number is 2999 or lower, you should make the second XFIL modification to the K2RF. This radio is serial number 3440, so this modification has already been done. All right, we gotta plug the amp back in, and you guys were supposed to remind me that the coax goes into the aux RF, and the power goes into the power plug, and the speaker goes into the speaker plug, and this ribbon cable goes on the front, but I didn't mark down where it went in terms of what pin one was. So let me double check that again, because I just forgot again. Cable's got a little bit of memory in it, so I can tell. And the reason why I need to plug this in, uh, I probably didn't need to plug it in. Let's unplug it again. No, because it plugs into the front. I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go along. Let me turn this on. And then we plug in power here. And then we plug in power here. Right, and she is on manual time. Turn on the K2 and verify that you see the usual L-Craft display. If you see info 080 or no display, you might have done it wrong. All right, so the display says the normal thing. Let's turn it off and on, and it should say L-Craft, and it does, and we get the normal display. Excellent. Tap the menu button and then use the band plus band minus buttons to get to SSBA and SSBC menu entries. If you see hyphen hyphen displayed for A and C, the adapter's microcontroller is not communicating with the main processor or the control board. Make sure U1 on the SSB adapter is not plugged in backwards. Also verify that R12 is installed. I might not have installed R12 because this kit was already made. Let's get after it. Okay, rearrange, lower down. Look at that high quality professional production work. Tap the menu button. Tap. And then we need to go to SSBA and SSBC by tapping band plus and band minus. There is SSBA, it does not display hyphens. And SSBC, and it does not display hyphens. Fantastic. Tap mode to select CW mode. I guess I need to get out of menu first. Lower sideband, upper sideband, CW mode. Okay. Set RF gain to max. RF gain to max. It is at max. AF gain midway. That's all the way up. That's all the way down. So that is midway. Preamp on. All right. Preamp right there. On. Verify the K2 performs the same on CW receive as it did prior to installing the SSB adapter. Okay, 
Now we gotta find an SSB station. And in order to do that, we need an antenna. Details, details, details. He said 7.70. Okay, receive is good. Let's tune to a clear frequency and call on our own and see how the reverse beacon network picks us up. All right, perfect. We have signal. Okay, signals don't appear to be any weaker. I'm gonna skip over troubleshooting. I'm gonna turn this off. Every so often you run into a little bit of a problem. Eh, well, problem, it's not really a problem. The Elecraft K2, if I had built this myself, I would have made this probe all along the way. However, I didn't build it myself. I bought it pre-assembled and they did a fantastic job, but that means I don't have this, this probe device. So I need to make it up. So I went and dug around in my spot in my shop and I have this handy dandy little clip on test probe deal that has a nice little flying lead coming off the end of it, which would be, they, they say to use RG174 coax, but this secondary connection here isn't connected to anything. It's center pin of the coax goes to a 10 picofarad capacitor, which then goes to the probe tip. Great. Let me raid my stash for 10 picofarad capacitors. And wouldn't you know it, I ain't got one. So I went to Amazon, purveyor of all things good and evil, and grabbed some capacitors. That's probably a lifetime supply considering most of the stuff I build is kits and already comes with capacitors in it, but I need one 10 picofarad capacitor. So I'm gonna take one 10 picofarad capacitor out and quickly close that before they wind up all over the shop because that's how stuff works. Warm up my soldering iron because I'll just go ahead and solder it to the one end. On the other end though, I can use this DuPont wire to plug into the radio and then I can plug this capacitor into the DuPont wire. I'm gonna take that and fold it in half to make it a little thicker on the one side. And that will give us better contact. That seems like a good solid connection there. Excellent. There's about a million different ways to do this. This is just the method that I am choosing to do. So I'm gonna tin the wire, get a little bit of solder on the wire, and then I will bring my capacitor to it and melt them together. And that's all it takes. And I can very easily take that apart. Let's get back to the radio. So I'm going to plug my test probe into that, make sure the radio is off, which it is, and then plug this into the frequency counter part on the back of the radio. Let's get back to the instructions. All right, BFO test. Connect the K2's internal frequency counter cable to TP2. We did that. Tap the menu button and scroll to the Cal menu entry. All right, tap, scroll, Cal menu entry, hold down, edit, Switch to FCTR, which I believe is frequency counter, right there. Okay, we've got a frequency counter up. You should now see a BFO frequency reading between 4910 and 4918, and 4913 is between those two numbers. The last digit may flicker, which they are. If the reading is 000 or out of range, the adapter may be loading down the BFO signal. Nope, we are good to go. If you're still in the Cal Frequency Counter mode, tap Menu, Menu, and select 40 meters. It's already there. Then use Mode to select LSB. There's LSB. And Xfil to select Filter 1. All right, we are on Filter 1. Use Menu to select Cal Filter. You'll see the filters setting displayed if the bandwidth number appears after FL1, e.g. FL1 2.2, it indicates that the variable bandwidth CW filter is presently selected, which I don't see that, and it is not. The small L indicates LSB mode, it is. Use the VFO knob to change the setting for FL OP1. OP1 is the next available setting after 2.49. 
All right, we're on OP1. OP1 refers to the first option filter, in this case, the fixed filter on the SSB adapter. You should hear a pronounced difference in the receiver's audio when you go from 2.49 to OP1, which we do. Since this causes the SSB adapter to switch between the CW filter and the SSB filter, leave the filter set for OP1. Note, OP2 through OP5 also select OP1 since only one fixed filter is available. BFO setup for LSB USB. Tap the band minus button to see the BFO setting for the first SSB filter, BF1. You should see a display similar to BF1T120L. I see BF1T139L. That's very similar. The BFO control parameter has a range of 0 to 255, okay? Lowercase letter T appears in the display. This is a reminder that on transmit, BFO setting BF1 is always used regardless of how you set the BFO for filter 2 through filter 4. Tap display to show the present frequency, all right? Display and the present frequency 4914.7. Adjust the VFO knob until the BFO is as close as possible to the LSB BF1T frequency from table 3. Then tap band minus to return to the BFO parameter display. I am looking for 4913.5. Well, look at that. You can hear the signals just come right up as I get closer to it. 4913.5. Okay, those last two digits move quite a bit. Okay, that looks good. Then tap band minus to return to the parameter display. And we're at 106 now. Tap mode to select USB mode. You should now see a display similar to BF1T200U, and I see BF1T209U. Tap display to show the frequency. We're gonna do this all over again. Adjust the VFO knob until it is as close to the number, in my case, 4916.3. Close enough. Exit the menu by tapping Menu. Using only FL1, listen to a few SSB stations. Let's find an SSB station. Let's get into the right sideband. That's uh, FT8. There we go. Another thing I should probably try, but um, yeah, that's that's great. Well, back uh, you know in those earlier years, you used let's try a different band. All those things. This is your... All right, she sounds good on SSB. Now we need to get the microphone plugged in. Bag of parts time. I had to order these from Mauser because I did not have them in stock. But what we need to do is add some parts to the front of this to control the microphone. So the first thing I need to do is get this board off of here. And there are two screws. There's one right here and one right here. Let's get them out. This radio has the real-time clock module in it. So I need to remove that as well, which is where one of those screws goes. So there is the, what is it called? They always have a name for these things. KAF2, because that makes sense. That's what I would have called it. Anyway, there's the real-time clock module. And then what do we need to do? Ah, that's right. There's a standoff for the clock module that's not part of the original instructions that gets in the way. And then very carefully pull this panel off the front. And now we're done with this, we can move it out of the way. And we need to get to work on removing these knobs here. The VFO doesn't really matter which direction it goes in. All the rest of these knobs have an indication of where they go. So I'm going to turn these fully clockwise until they reach their stops. And then I'll be able to pull them off and know how they go back on. Each one of these has two different Allen screws on it. That's too big. And as long as you loosen them both, they come right off. And then once you get them off, there is a little mark here. So you can tell exactly where it needs to go back in case you ever move it. I'm going to breeze through these and then we'll come back when these are off. All right, that's a really, that's a really nice VFO. Solid metal right there. That's nice. Solid brass. Gives it a little bit of weight. Makes it feel good in the hands. We need to pull off 
this little ring right here so that the connector can pass through the back side of the panel. And there is a washer there, so I'm not going to scratch up the front panel. But even if I did, it's hidden behind the VFO. And then this little adjustment screw here needs to come out. And then we need to pull off these two parts up top. And now we're done with that piece. Transistor, resistor, and then this should be a bunch of capacitors. No, this is the resistor network, because I have the capacitors already. The resistor network is held in interestingly. The capacitors, which I don't have here, let me go get those, and I need the pin headers. So I need to get those as well. Capacitor pack achieved, this is the same one from earlier. Since this is already a populated board, we're gonna to have to be really careful putting some of these pieces in, but let's figure out where they all go. We need C4 through C8. So we have C4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then we need Q3, which goes right in there, is the transistor. And we need RP3, which is the resistor pack, which goes in here. So let's warm up the soldering iron. So resistor arrays, resistor networks have some text on them and a little dot, which indicates pin one. And on the circuit board, pin one is indicated in this case by a square via and the number one. And all this really is, is a bunch of resistors in line so that I don't need to do 10 little resistors. Well, eight little resistors. Fresh solder, get my tip nice and clean. Nothing beats a clean tip. I'm gonna put a little blob of solder on the tip. And I'm gonna put a little blob of solder on the part to hold it in place. And then I can do my handy dandy little adjustment trick. Warm the solder up again. Push the part in the way it belongs, double check. And then I can go tack down the rest of the pins. And this is a very large resistor. All they tell you in the manual is that resistor R13 is 68.1K and a 1% tolerance. Doesn't tell you how many volts or watts or anything. It just tells you that. Resistors do not have a polarization, so I can put it in any old way that I want. Yeah. All right, next up. Transistor time. And transistors have a sort of half moon shape, and there's kind of a half moon shape on the silk screen on the circuit board. And one of these legs is just a tad off center from the rest. So I'm going to take the center one and I'm going to bend it out. And then bend it back so that it will fit in that hole better. And it doesn't have to go all the way down flush with the board. Just make it look eyeball pretty for yourself. And that looks eyeball pretty for me. So we're good to go on that. Continuing to run out of parts. Okay, now we need all those capacitors and they are 0 0.01 microfarad. And if we go look and I take 0 0.01 microfarad, that converts into 10 nanofarads which I have 10 nanofarads right there. So how many do I need? I need five, and they're the ones labeled 103, four, five. This particular brand of capacitor doesn't have any polarization. So I'm just gonna put them in, and I'm just gonna make sure that the numbers all line up on the same side, just to be neat. And once they're in, you can't see the numbers anyway, and those control knobs are getting in my way. So I'm just gonna use the pliers here to hold the, the part so that I can aim a little bit better. Just like that. And there's no death grip. I'm not squeezing the life out of it. I'm just holding it gently so I can get some range. So my fingers aren't in the way of those knobs. Okay, and then next up is some pin header work. Are these spaced good for dual row pin headers? They are spaced good for dual row pin headers.
All right, lost that. And I missed cutting these two. And this is where it gets to be really close to this button. So we just gotta be extra careful. And so to start off with, I'm gonna tack down this back corner pin here and then verify that everything's in place where it belongs. And I'm gonna take my time. Okay, that looks like it's supposed to. So I'm gonna put down another pin somewhere else. And now that that one's done, I'm gonna come back and clean this first one up. Looks good. Now let's let the fun begin. Okay, no casualties and we're out of parts. And it was just pure luck that these things go straight across. Maybe Ellicraft designed this for the MC43 from Kenwood. Maybe that was it. I wish there were more standards. One, two, three, four, and then we skip two and we do the bottom two. One, two, three, four, five, six, perfect. I'm gonna put that in. I'm gonna put this standoff in to hold it in place just enough to get it all tested out. Need this board here. We probably don't need this board, but I'm gonna test it under same, same conditions, if that makes sense. All right, let's get rearranged. All right, now we have a couple of things to do. If your K2 serial number is 299 or lower, which mine is not, so that does not apply, Locate the carrier control balance R1 on the KSB2 module. Set it close to the center of its range. So I'm going to make that adjustment all the way clockwise, counterclockwise, all the way clockwise, and we will send, set it to the center-ish. Which is right about there. All right, done. Turn on the power. Select 40 meters LSB mode and filter. You know what, to make my life a little bit easier, I am gonna put this front panel on just enough to see what I'm doing, which means we need to take the microphone off, which I think we need to do that for the next step anyway. All right, so turn on the power. Well, it's working. Select 40 meters. It's 40 meters, LSB mode, which it is, and filter one. All right, there's filter one, and then RF gain to max. All right, RF gain is at max. I'm gonna turn the volume down until we get to the next step. Disconnect the microphone, done. Select SSB-C in the menu and set the parameter to two to one, two to one compression. So now we need to go into menu, SSBC. Two to one. Select SSBA in the menu and set the parameter to bow, carrier balance. Bow. All right. That sounds better already. Exit the menu. Adjust R1 slowly for a minimum indication on the S meter. This should occur close to the center of the range. If R1 has no effect, see troubleshooting. All right, back to R1. All the way up. And that's nothing. What are we trying to set it to? For a minimum indication, that would be a minimum indication. Check. Select SSBA in the menu and set to parameter three. This will disable carrier balance mode. Menu, SSBA and set it to three. Excellent. So our course carrier balance adjustment is done. Our fine carrier balance adjustment. Use the menu to set SSBA to 3 and SSBC to 2.1. We already did that. Let's double check. SSBA is 3. 
SSBC is two to one, done. Connect the microphone, select LSB mode and filter one, set power to five watts. Connecting the microphone, let's see if we don't let any smoke out. Everything good so far. Microphone is connected, let's exit the menu. We wanna set power to five watts. All right, power is set to five watts. Connect the dummy load. Okay, hang on. Verify that pushing the PTT switch on the mic puts the K2 into transit mode. All right, it does. We can see the green lights light up. And we actually are getting power out on our power meter. Press PTT, but do not talk. Locate the transmitted signal on the external receiver. The VFO setting you use on the external receiver to listen to your K2's carrier will be different than that used to tune the SSB voice signal. If you're tuning, if you're tuned to a setting that allows you to hear the voice signal, you'll be at the zero beat frequency of the carrier and will not be able to hear a tone. Oh, okay, so it is, it is putting out a signal. I just need to find it on another radio. That'll be fun. Let me get another radio set up. All right, we have another radio achieved. We have the 705 sitting right there and it is connected up to the DX Commander. The K2 is connected through the power meter to a dummy load sitting over here on the side. And I need to find the signal when I transmit. So let's transmit and watch our waterfall up here. There it is. So let's zoom in on that a bit. There she is. With the PTT switch pressed, adjust R1 on the SSB adapter for a minimum carrier signal amplitude using the receiver's S meter. This should occur near the middle of R1's range, typically slightly to the right. Repeat the adjustment setting using USB. Find the best compromise between LSB and USB. Minimum carrier signal amplitude on the receiver's S meter. Okay, so what are we seeing right now? Let's switch this over to meter mode. Okay, we are looking at this S meter right here, and we want minimum carrier signal amplitude on the receiver's S meter. So let me get this thing plugged in to that adjustment. And of course, my hand is right in the way. And she ain't moving at all. Repeat the adjustment using USB. Let's see if USB makes a difference. Okay, I went off frequency to see if it will give me a better sensitivity range. Nope, not seeing any adjustment. I'm gonna go back to the previous setting and get that set up just right. Because I think that we were already there. Just for grins, I got it all set up to do it a second time and I'm using the oscilloscope function on the 705. And let's see if it makes any difference. I don't think it's going to this way either. I have the level set at minus 30. I have the time set at one millisecond per division. And as I'm turning from full lock to lock, I'm seeing no difference on the signal meter, no difference on the waveform. And this is supposed to be a fine adjustment. So my assumption is, is that this being a fine adjustment, it could be just fine enough that I am not making any adjustment. For this test, we need the frequency counter probe connected back to the probe connector there. We've got that all set up. It says select 40 meters, LSB mode, filter one. So 40 meters, LSB mode, filter one. The settings apply to all bands, so we can do it on 40 meters for everything. Set up your filters exactly as shown in table three below using Cal Fill. Both the filters, FL1 through four, and BFO's BF1 through four must be set up for each operating mode. The BFO settings are given as actual frequencies, 4912, 4917, rather than as BFL, BFO control value 0 to 255. As described earlier, the display button is used in CalFill to set up the BFO frequencies. You may not be able to set the frequencies to exactly those shown, but try to get as close as possible. The 10 hertz digit may flicker, which is normal. Read all of pages 21 and 22 to become familiar with SSB operations. Set power for five watts. We did that, select LSB, we did that. Monitor your transmitted voice signal in another receiver or contact a nearby station and have them listen carefully. Then as explained on page 22, Adjust the BFO, adjust the LSB BF1 value for the best transmitted signal quality. Switch to USB mode and adjust the USB BF1 for best transmitted signal quality. Optional for receive mode BFO fine tuning, you can use an audio spectrum analysis program such as Spectrogram, which runs on PC compatible computers. Okay, this is where it gets fun. We gotta go back and we gotta do Filter settings for a whole bunch of different bands in this table three here. And if you remember from before, we had to use the figures from page 10 and we don't know what those figures are. So we use the defaults 
of 3.6, so let's just get after it. Use the menu to select Cal Fill and activate the filter setup display. So menu, and we go to Cal Fill, and then we long press menu until it changes its display. Remove the chevrons underneath. So now it's FL1 OP1, and we are in LSB mode, so that's the L. And so that is set properly, I think. Use the VFO to change. Okay, yep. To OP1, tap band minus. See the BFO setting for filter BF1. You should see a display that looks like what it looks like right there. And we need to tap display to see the current frequency. Adjust the VFO knob until it is as close as possible to the frequency from table one. So we are at filter one LSB 4913.5. And it said that last digit will dance a bit. This is a very touchy control. I can either do four nine. or 5-2, but I can't do 5-0. Oh. Okay, 4-9 it is. Tap mode. Nope, can't do that. Display. Mode to select USB. And then display again to see the frequency, which we're looking at, and it should be 49-16.3. Okay. There we go, it's dancing between 3.0 and 3.1. I'll take that, that's better than the last one. And then we'll hit display, band plus, band minus. Oh, nope, just ruined it. 49.16.3. FL2 should read OP1 also. And we're still on a USB mode. This should be 4916.1. Okay, store, band minus is store, okay. And then BF3. Oh, nope, I got to do BF2 still. Let's go back to BF2 for the lower sideband. And then this should be OP1 also. Is there no OP1? Why is there no OP1 for that? So BF2. Nothing. I think I'm missing a step here. Yeah, I am missing something there. BF2, lower sideband. Yeah, because for some reason it's supposed to say FL2. Menu. I'm going to change this to say filter. Long press to get into it. Filter OP1. OP2, lower sideband. Okay, so filter, filter one, OP1, good. It should say something like that, good. We switch it into display, we need it to say 4913.5, which it's as close as it's going to get, and then we need to hit band minus to store it. And then we hit menu again, Filter, long press menu to get in. And we want to change that to be OP2, OP1. Upper side band. And then we want to hit display. 
and this should be 4916.3, which it is. We hit band minus to store. We hit menu to get out, menu to get back in, change that to fill, long press menu, change filter to filter two, upper side band. And it should be FL2 OP1 upper side band. Then we hit display. We need to change this to 4913.5. Close enough. We hit band minus to store. We hit menu to exit. We hit menu to go in, filter, edit, and now we can do filter 3. Filter 3 is supposed to be 1.80. Let's change mode to lower sideband to do lower sideband first. Filter 3, 1.80, lower sideband. Display to get the frequency counter back, 4913.0. Band minus to store. Menu to exit. Menu again to exit. Menu to get in. Long press menu to get over. To filter. Long press again until the chevrons disappear. And we want to change this to upper side band. It should say FIL3 1.80 upper side band. Hit display to see the frequency counter. This needs to be 4915.5. Band minus to store, menu to exit, menu to exit again. We're going to change the mode back to lower sideband before we get in. It's a good thing I put that front panel display back on. Okay. Menu to get in, long press to get over, down to filter. Long press until the chevrons disappear and we are at filter four. So we press the filter button to get to filter four. It should say off or point seven, which is note three. And what is note three about? Filter four on LSB USB is shown set to off, which means it will not be accessible with the exfil button. Any filter can be turned off except for filter one to use this filter for PSK31 and other data modes. Set FL4 to point seven or narrower. The BF4 settings shown provide a center frequency of about a thousand. Well, we're here and we're doing it, so let's do it. Okay, so we are on FL4 and it should say 0 0.7. FL4 0 0.7L. And then we hit display to see the frequency counter. And we do. 4912.7. Okay, band minus to store, menu to exit, menu to exit again, change our mode to upper side band, menu to get in, long press menu to get to filter, down to filter, Long press again until the chevrons go away. We're at filter 4. Filter 4, 0 0.7 USB. Hit display to see the frequency counter. 4914.7. Okay. Band minus to store. Menu to exit. And that got a little wonky at the end. Let me do this one more time. Menu, long press menu, change that to filter. Long press until the chevrons go away, filter 4, 0 0.70, USB, display, 4914.7, store. Okay, that was just the display of the BF4. And we have now calibrated all of the filters. That was fun, with a capital F. 
If you're like me and you got your KSB2 board already assembled off of eBay, because these things are in extremely short, rare supply, you started in the instruction manual for the installation at the part where you put this board into the radio. That's where this journey has been a lot of fun for me because I just got off the phone with Dave from Elecraft Support and there is a step about three pages up from that where you need to cut a capacitor. Let's go get that cut because right now, every time I PTT, I'm sending CW because the radio doesn't yet know that it's not a CW only rig. Let's get into it. Right here is C167 and it is right next to the jumper header where the KSB2 board gets installed. This capacitor C167 has a very weird footprint on the board. I'm going to go in and clip one leg of the capacitor if I can get in there properly. I hope somehow. Please, please make this easy for me. And I'm trying to do this in a way that it'll be very obvious that it's been done if somebody comes in to look at this thing in the future. because I want to leave a clue behind. Okay, so I've got that cut and lifted. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of electrical tape and I'm going to put it down on the board. And this piece is still too big. And that way, if somebody comes in here looking, they can see that it's been tampered with and they can kind of go, well, why did this guy cut that thing up? And then they'll know when they get in there and look at it a little bit harder. that it was done on purpose. And then this way, if that leg ever does come back down, it's not gonna make electrical contact and cause this thing to accidentally sometimes transmit CW. Let's get it put back together. Okay, somebody was on the 7200 frequency I was using before. So I'm at 7199 now. I'm at 7199 here. I am going into my dummy load over here on the side, which is gonna put out just strong enough of a signal to be heard locally. So let's go ahead and try it. I push the button and you can see nothing. And now let's talk. Kilo, Mike 9 Golf. And you can see some modulation there. Let's turn the volume all the way up. Kilo, Mike 9 Golf. So I put my hand over the microphone so that you might be able to hear it out of the speaker. Kilo, Mike 9 Golf. Testing, testing, testing. Kilo, Mike 9 Golf. One, two, three, four. Four, three, two, one. Audio. So far, so good. Let's keep making progress. Kilo, Mike 9, Golf. Kilo, Mike 9, Golf. Kilo, Mike 9, Golf. Kilo, Mexico 9, Germany. Copy the 5-5. Five five. You're 5-9 five into Northwest Wisconsin. Thank you for the contact. 73. 5-5 five, five into Arkansas. She had a little bit of trouble here in my call sign. That's probably me. But 5-5 five, five into Arkansas. I will take that. That was fantastic. This has been a lot of work getting this thing up and running. Hey, KK6USY, are you out there? This is Kilo Mike 9 Golf. All right, copy the 5-5 five, five San Francisco. You are 5-9 into Northwest Wisconsin. Copy the 5-9, sounds good. Uh, I'm probably pushing a little more power than you, about 150 watts here. Yeah, you definitely got me. I'm at 111 watts because this thing goes to 111. Thanks for the contact, my friend. All right, copy the 111. Uh, thank you for the contact. You can't think you will be clear. So I got to tell you folks, this would have been a lot more fun of a project if I had gotten it in its original kit form, because what happened is every time I got a bunch of parts in, about five minutes later, I would realize I needed more parts. And there's really not a good way to tell unless you take the whole thing down to bits, do a complete and total inventory of what you have, what you don't have, and then go order them. And... I kind of wanted to experience this as a step-by-step -step kind of thing, which I did. It worked out. I think I learned something. It's a lot of fun. The thing works on SSB. I'm going to get to work on making some more contacts with it and enjoying it a little bit more and probably going to do a live contact stream on this coming up in the future. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, there is a video right over here I think you'll enjoy next.
Thanks for being awesome. I'll see you over there.